And as you brought up more information there, gathering more information, how often is more information the key to better decisions? Or can this, you know, lead to indecisiveness? Analysis paralysis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. And uh, it's a fascinating question. And I think that, look, in some domains, more information is better for sure. But there's a very, very famous series of ex- psychological experiments that relate to this. And um, the original one was done by Paul Slovak back in the 1970s, but this has been replicated quite a few times. But I'll, I'll tell you what Slovak did back in the day. So what he did, uh, he went to people who were handicappers, so betting, betting on horse races. And he had uh, a menu of something like 80, 88 pieces of information. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take uh, a, some bits of this, uh, say five bits of information, then place a bet, double that, place a bet, double it again, place a bet, and so forth. And so uh, then he could examine two things. One was how accurate their bets were. So, so did the incremental information help them? And the second thing he measured, interestingly, was confidence. And what he found was the accuracy of the bets truly didn't improve much at all as the new information came in. And yet confidence tended to soar. So there's this disconnect that as people have more information, they tend to get more confident, but no more accurate. So one of the things I like to talk a lot about, and, and by the way, there's a logical reason for this, right? Which is something like, uh, you know, you prioritize. If you're a handicapper and I say, here's a menu of things you can pick from, you're going to choose the things that are most relevant to predicting a horse race, right? So that's, so, so there's, a, there's a substantial degradation of the value of the information as it's coming in, right? So that's this interesting contrast that often more information doesn't help us, yet it does make us more confident. And then certainly if that confidence becomes misplaced, that, that raises the risk of, uh, of, of, again, making bad decisions or bad bets or what have you. So that, that is, um, I think that's a really interesting dynamic. The key on this analysis paralysis, I mean, that really has to do with a timeliness thing. So if you have, you're in a situation where you have to make a decision, it's often the best to, to wait as long as you can before you have to make a decision because new information may help you. But if you're in a position where you should be making decisions, uh, that, that is, a, you know, again, you have to just move and, and work with what you have. So that's where it becomes a problem. Yeah, and one of the things I've heard you speak about is actually weighting information. How do you go about this and, and how do you think about weighting information? Yeah, I think it's a very, I mean, it's not, it's not a super easy thing. But for example, you might take a simple example of how to think about a value of a corporation. And it's usually, it's usually the case that for a particular company um, or a particular stock of a company, there are usually two or three variables that are, that are hanging in the balance that you have to figure out one way or another. And uh, the sooner you can get to those um, and uh, come up with a, a thoughtful, differentiated point of view, the better off you're going to be. You mentioned uh, at the beginning that I uh, teach at Columbia Business School, and, and sort of the capstone of the course is the students present to real portfolio managers. So it's a, it's a very live setting. They're, pre, they're, they're uh, saying buy or sell particular stocks, and the portfolio managers are giving them um, feedback real time. Probably the, the number one thing the students hear from those professionals is, you gave me too much information. And you need to figure out what matters for that particular company or that particular industry. So this, exactly, this idea of prioritization um, is really is really crucial. So um, that's one example. Now, in one of my books, I wrote an, another case of things that sound impressive that are not. So for instance, uh, uh, we had a technology analyst who was trying to figure out whether technology spending was going to go up or down, which of course is a laudable objective. And so the analyst surveyed Fortune 1000 chief information officers. Well, if you look at the, for- and so they say, you know, we talked to 75 of them. When you look at the Fortune 1000, right, it's very, very, it's a power law. It's very skewed. So just a handful of companies spend almost all the money and the tail spends very little money. So if you're talking to, you know, company number 200 to 1000, they're really not moving the needle. Whereas companies, you know, zero through 50 are really the ones that are making it, making it happen. So that's an example of something that sounds superficially quite impressive, but unless you understand the actual contributions of the companies, uh, you're, you're going to get a misread on the situation. 